So with that, it is my distinct honor and privilege and, and certainly uh, pleasure uh, to introduce you to our keynote speaker today. Our keynote speaker is a fearless consumer advocate who has made her life's work the fight to make sure that everyone has a fair shot to get ahead. She is recognized as one of the nation's top experts on bankruptcy and the financial pressures facing families. Widely credited for the original thinking, political courage, and relentless persistence that led to the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Time Magazine called her a new sheriff on Wall Street and named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world multiple times. A law professor for more than 30 years, including nearly 20 years as the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, and a national best-selling author, she is also a superhero that may be found in Female Force, Elizabeth Warren, a comic book series about empowering women. And I must tell you that she is definitely a heroine of mine. Last year, she had two major speeches that talked about the issue of the racial and ethnic wealth gap. And in one, in September of 2015, at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, she identified three tools of racial oppression. One, racialized violence. Two, denial of the right to vote. And three, denial of economic opportunity here in the United States of America. And so one quote in particular stood out from that speech for me, and I'll just mention it here. She said, it's time to come down hard on predatory practices that allow financial institutions to systematically strip wealth out of communities of color. One of the ugly consequences of bank deregulation was that there was no cop on the beat when too many financial institutions figured out that they could make great money by tricking, trapping, and defrauding targeted families. Now we have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and we need to make sure it stays strong and independent so that it can do its job and make credit markets work for black families, Latino families, white families, all families. Without further ado, please welcome U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren. so nice. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. That was such a terrific introduction. Although I have to say, I'm still waiting. Uh, if I'm going to be a superhero, I want that lasso of truth, right? That's the part I really want. Maybe that in the invisible airplane. That'll, that'll really make it work. So thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Maya. Thank you for this. I am so delighted to have a chance to be able to talk with you today. I, I, I want to talk to you about something that I talk about a lot. I talk a lot about what has happened to America's middle class. And I talk about how America built a great middle class. And the very compressed version of the story is that coming out of the Great Depression, America invested in our people. We put more money into education so that more kids would have opportunities. We put more money into infrastructure, like roads and bridges and power, so that if someone wanted to start a small business or expand a business, all of the basics were already in place. We put more money into research so that we could build great jobs out of these new inventions. And it worked. From the 1930s to the early 1980s, GDP keeps going up, and the key is that wages went up right along with it for most Americans. And that's kind of the fundamental story about, about the building of America's middle class. But there is a dark underbelly to this story. Median family income was growing for both white families and African American families, but African American incomes were only a fraction of white incomes. In the mid-1950s, the median income for African-American families was just a little more than half the median income for white families. 
And the problem went far beyond income alone. Uh, just take a look at housing. For most of America, I mean most of America, everybody not quite at the top or, or exactly at the bottom, for most of America, buying a home is the number one way to build wealth. It is the retirement plan, pay off the home and live on Social Security. It is the college plan, if you need to, borrow against the house. It is emergency savings. Uh, it's the inheritance to give the kids and the grandkids so the next generation gets a boost. It is the economic foundation of a secure foothold in the middle class. And for much of the 20th century, that's how it worked for generation after generation of white Americans, but not for black Americans. Entire legal structures were built to prevent African Americans from building economic security through home ownership. Legally enforced segregation, restrictive deeds, redlining, land contracts, so that coming out of the Great Depression, America built a middle class, but systematic discrimination kept most African American families from being part of it. Now, the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s was also an economic movement. During the 1960s and the 1970s, there was some progress in closing the racial wealth gap, but then, during the Reagan years of the 1980s, that gap exploded. From 1984 to 2009, the wealth gap between black families and white families tripled. Think about what that means. If things weren't already bad enough by then, the crash of 2008 made them worse. The housing collapse destroyed trillions of dollars in family wealth across this country. But the crash hit African American families like a punch in the gut. Because middle class black families' wealth was disproportionately concentrated in home ownership, these families were hit harder by the housing collapse. But they also got hit harder because of discriminatory lending practices. And I just want to say that again and underline it. Discriminatory lending practices in the 21st century. We're not talking about a long time ago. We're talking about now in this country. Recently, several big banks and other mortgage lenders paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fines, admitting that they illegally steered black and Latino borrowers into more expensive mortgages and white borrow than white borrowers who had essentially the same credit. Tom Perez, who at the time was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, called it the racial surtax. And it hurt, because during the crash, white households lost on average 11% of their wealth. Now, make no mistake, Losing 11% of your wealth in one crash, that hurts. It hurts bad. But black households lost over 30% of their wealth, and that is catastrophic. In 2013, the median wealth of white households was 13 times that of black households. And it's still happening. Last year, the National Fair Housing Alliance filed a discrimination complaint against real estate agents in Mississippi after an investigation showed that those agents consistently steered white buyers away from interracial neighborhoods and black buyers away from affluent ones. Another investigation showed similar results in multiple cities across our nation. And in Massachusetts, a recent study found that African Americans and Latinos were much more likely to be rejected for a mortgage than whites, even when they had similar income levels. These discriminatory practices have their intended effect. Middle class African Americans and Latinos are much more likely than whites to live in lower income neighborhoods. This means that the children of middle class African American and Latino parents are more likely to be stuck in under-resourced schools and in areas with higher crime rates. 
Another way that wealth is stripped out of our communities of color is through predatory practices that target those who already live on the margins of the mainstream financial system. And I want you to think about one part of this. Um, many Americans use traditional banks and credit unions to cash their checks, to pay their bills, to borrow money. But for millions more, traditional banking is essentially closed off. For some, the problem is a $100 minimum balance to open a checking account, and that's not easy to get and easy to maintain. For others, access gets harder because there are simply fewer banks nearby. Data show that big banks are closing branches in communities with median incomes below $50,000 at the same time that they are opening branches in communities with median incomes above $100,000. Without access to mainstream banks, millions of families turn to check cashers, payday lenders, title loan outfits, and the costs can be crushing. The average family that relies on alternative financial services spends an average of $2,412 a year, about 10% of their income, just on fees and interest in the financial services system. Think about that. Just to put that in context, the typical family spends about 10% of its income on food. So these are families who are spending as much on just access to pay your bills and cash your checks and get a small dollar loan from time to time as they spend on food. Why? Because they can't find a way to use the traditional banking services. Now, for those who end up with payday loans, the costs can spiral out of control. A single loan can quickly become a cycle of debt after debt after debt, fee after fee after fee. Title loans can be just as bad, but they add the extra pain of losing the car and losing the way to be able to get to work. The business model for many of these lenders is simply to trap people, ensnare families that can't build enough of a financial cushion to weather the ups and downs, and that trap makes it sure that they will never be able to build that cushion. So how does this happen? Well, it happens in part because of deliberate policy choices that are made right here in Washington, D.C. Deliberate policy choices that favor those with money and power. The choice to leash up the financial cops right? So the financial institutions are turned loose. The choice to bail out the big banks while families suffered. The choice to spend our tax dollars on subsidies for big oil and tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans instead of investing in economic development in our communities and building more opportunities for hardworking families. One consequence of these choices is that 90% of America sees virtually no wage growth. For African Americans who were so far behind in the early part of the 20th century, who got knocked down again in the 1980s, who got hit so hard by the 2008 crash, that means that African American families have been hit hard once again. And now it is time for us to make new choices to ensure that every family, regardless of race, has a fighting chance to build an economic future for themselves and for their families. It is up to us to take the actions necessary to reduce unemployment, to end wage stagnation, to close the income gap between white and black families. And I know that at this conference, there will be a lot of innovative suggestions a lot of good ideas that people are going to talk about, but I am not going to leave this stage without putting three on the table. Three things we could do right now. Places where abuses are rampant 
and too few regulators are paying attention. Our first step should be to come down hard on predatory practices that allow financial institutions to systematically strip wealth out of communities of color. Could I have an amen on that? There we go. One of the ugly consequences of bank deregulation was that there was no cop on the beat when too many financial institutions figured out that they could make great money by tricking families, by trapping families, and by defrauding families. Now we have a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Woohoo! Um, we do. And they have already forced the biggest banks in this country to return. They've only been up and running, think about this, for four years, to return more than $11 billion directly to people who were cheated. They enforce the fair credit laws. They will soon have rules out on payday lending, and they are already working hard to try to clean up some of the worst credit markets. This should matter big time for black families, for Latino families, for any families that are repeatedly and systematically cheated. And it certainly should matter for businesses. A study just released right here at the Center for Global Policy Solutions found that right now, America is losing out on 1.1 million minority-owned businesses because of past and present discrimination. This includes discrimination against entrepreneurs of color in obtaining the loans they need to launch new businesses. Now, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, is a cop on the beat, a cop who watches the banks and the payday lenders. That kind of cop can make a huge difference to families and to communities but I know you're going to be surprised by this. The banks don't like the cop. And they are lobbying Washington hard to try to get rid of that cop, to try to rein in that cop, to try to make that cop not get out there and do the job that needs to be done. We need to fight to keep the CFB cops strong and independent. So that's my first ask. We've got to be out there to fight for the agency that's out there to fight for our families. Can we do that one? I want to do a second one in financial services, since this is the area that, that I spend a lot of time in. We must reaffirm our commitment to the Community Reinvestment Act. We must reaffirm our commitment to hold banks accountable when they don't meet those obligations. You know, look at it this way. We give banks all sorts of special privileges. And what we ask for in return is that they will serve communities. The American people are holding up our end of the bargain. But for too long, many banks have not been holding up their end. And that has got to stop. Enforce Community Reinvestment Act. Yep, that's the second one. And just one more before I get out of here. And that is, it is time for the federal government to make real investments in communities of color. Dedicate more federal money to affordable housing programs and public transit. Invest in education so that every child, every child, has a real shot at graduating with the skills they need to get a decent job or go on to college. K-12 education should mean that funding in all public schools is fair and equitable and that our teachers and school leaders are supported and well-trained and motivated to help our kids prepare to succeed. No student should get a second-class education because she lives in a low-income neighborhood. So that's it for me on this. You know, this government works great for the rich and the powerful. It works really well for anyone who can hire an army of lobbyists and lawyers. But it is not working so well for the rest of America. It is time to make the big changes 
that will build an economy that works for working families, not one that is just rigged for the wealthy. We need to make choices that put working people and families first. We need to make choices that aim toward a better future for our children. We need to make choices that reflect our deepest values as Americans. And we need to make sure that every step along the way, communities of color are at the table when decisions are made, not as tokens so someone can check the diversity box, but as equal partners in the decisions that affect the direction of this country. I'm glad that you all are here today. Uh, I wish I could stay and be part of every part of this and be in every one of these arguments, but I just want to say, it is good that you come together. It is good that we magnify each other's voices because these are hard fights. But it has become clear to me in the time I have been in Washington, you don't get what you don't fight for. So. It is good to be your partners. We're going to stand shoulder to shoulder in this fight until we win. We're going to stand shoulder to shoulder and fight until all of our children have an equal opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warren. Let's hear it for her again. And thanks to each and every one of you who joined in our dialogue today about the racial wealth gap, its effect on marginalized households, and the impact on the U.S. economy. Uh, and of course, solutions for closing the gap. Uh, I just want to give you a few housekeeping notes. Um, we're encouraging all of you. We'll be sending a survey. We would like all of you to fill out that survey. And uh, it will be coming in a thank you email. Uh, and we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to also sign up for our listserv so that you can keep abreast of the work that we do. And I just want to say thank you again. It has been a fantastic day. You have been a stellar audience. And until next year, take care.